Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing type 1 activation of endothelial cells. Okay, so we've discussed that histamine is going to bind to uh, the histamine 1 receptor on the basolateral side of endothelial cells. And remember, this is going to happen in arterioles, at least terminal arterioles. It's going to happen in capillaries, and it's going to happen in venules. So it's happening in all these three different locations, all three types of blood vessel that we're going to have within our tissue. Okay? Uh, and when the histamine binds to the H1 receptor, or in fact, there are many other inflammatory um, ligands which will have their own GPCR receptors, uh, which will be coupled to the GQ heterotrimeric G protein. But we're taking histamine as our archetypal example. So histamine will bind to the H1 receptor, and the H1 receptor will become catalytically active, and it's going to act on the GQ heterotrimeric G protein. So it's going to chop off the guanosine diphosphate from the alpha subunit of the GQ heterotrimeric G protein and replace it with a guanosine triphosphate, which it gets from the cytoplasm of the cell. So you get this alpha Q GTP, and then you'll also get the beta gamma subunit here. Right, so what happens next? Well, alpha Q GTP is going to activate another enzyme which is in the uh, cell membrane of the cell. So here is the cell membrane again, the phospholipid by there. And in the cell membrane, there is an enzyme known as phospholipase C beta, which is often abbreviated to PLC beta. Okay? And the alpha Q GTP is going to come and bind to phospholipase C beta, and it's going to activate it. So this enzyme is phospholipase C beta and it's of the beta type, so there are many different isoforms of phospholipase C, and uh, the one that's specifically activated by the alpha-Q GTP complex is phospholipase C of the beta type. Now, what does phospholipase C of the beta type do uh, to uh, once it's activated by alpha-Q GTP? Well, the answer is it breaks down the normal component of the phospholipid by there. Okay, it breaks down something known as PIP2, but I want you to actually understand what PIP2 is. So I'm just going to talk you through what the structure of PIP2 is, and we're going to do it in cartoon form. We're not going to quite go in for the atom-by-atom uh, atom structure. We'll do it in cartoon form. So, the phospholipid bimer here is made up of phospholipids, and what I want to show you is that PIP2, or PIP2, is just a modified phospholipid. Okay, so let's draw, start with a normal phospholipid. So a normal phospholipid looks like this in cartoon form. Okay, so let's highlight the different portions up. So these two vertical lines are known as the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid, and they are made up of uh, long-chain fatty acids, or long-chain carboxylic acids, or just fatty acids, which have been esterified to the first and the second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule, uh, which is the backbone for the phospholipid structure. So these are fatty acids, or also called long-chain carboxylic acids. Long-chain carboxylic acids is the more correct name for them. It's the name that a chemist would use, whereas fatty acids is the name that a biochemist would use. Right, okay, so you've got two of these fatty acids, and they've been linked by ester links to um, this glycerol molecule, which is here. This is the horizontal line, which I'm now colouring in green. So, this is glycerol. Okay, and again, glycerol is the old biochemist's name for this molecule. The more proper uh, chemist's name for it is to now call it propane 1, 2, 3 trial. And although propane 1,2,3-trial is a mouthful, uh, it actually does tell you exactly what this molecule is. It's propane, a free carbon molecule, where you have three alcohol groups, one of each of those carbons. Okay, so you have a um, free carbon molecule, and each carbon has a single alcohol group coming off it. And then to two of these alcohol groups, the first two, you've esterified the carboxylic acid groups of these two fatty acids here, and to this third alcohol group, you've got this ball structure that I've drawn here. And this is the phosphate group, which I'm now highlighting in pink. Okay, so this is a phosphate group. 
and this is the phospho bit of the phospholipid, so this is a phosphate group. Okay, so you have linked this phosphate group to the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule by a phosphoester link. Okay, so the entire thing now is called a phospholipid. Okay, and again, phospholipid is the modern name for um, phos. Well, it's the it's the correct name for this molecule, but there is an old biochemist name for a phospholipid, and no one would ever call a phospholipid this. But when we're talking about modified phospholipids, this word is used all the time, and this is to call a phospholipid a phosphatidate molecule. Okay, so the old name for a phospholipid molecule is to call it a phosphatidate molecule. So this is a phosphatidate molecule. And the phospholipid bilayer consists of these two layers of phosphatidate or phospholipids. Right, so now let's discuss the structure of PIP2. And for this, I'll need another piece of paper. Okay, so PIP2 is the shorthand for phosphatidyl inositol uh, 4 5 bisphosphate. So phos Phosphatidyl, and now you uh, see why it's important to know that a phospholipid is also known as phosphatidate because you're now in an ability to potentially guess what phosphatidyl means. So phosphatidyl inositol 4 5 bisphosphate. Okay, and what I hope to convince you of is that this molecule is just an altered phospholipid. It's just a phospholipid with a bigger head, basically. And this is often abbreviated to PIP2, or just PIP2. Right, and the reason for that is the P stands for the phosphatidyl, the I is for inositol, and then the final P is for phosphate, and then you put a little 2 here to denote that there are two phosphate groups. So let's see the structure of this molecule. So it, again, is a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer, and basically it has the two... Well, it's a phosphatidate molecule, just with a bit stuck off it. So here is a phosphatidate molecule again, okay? So here are the long-chain carboxylic acids, esterified to the first and second alcohol groups of our glycerol molecule, and here is our phosphate group coming off the third alcohol group of our glycerol molecule. Okay, so this is the phosphatidyl bit of this molecule, and now we need to link it to inositol. So we need to put off this phosphate group an inositol molecule. Now I'll show you what the molecular, sorry, not the molecular, what the skeletal structure of inositol is, because it's a molecule that people have generally never heard of. Okay, but it's a six-membered carbon ring. So if we draw the skeletal structure in, of inositol, then here is the six-membered carbon ring. And remember, in skeletal structures, you don't show carbon atoms. Okay, so the, implicitly, there are six carbons in a ring here. Then every single one of these carbons has an alcohol group off it. Okay, and you'll notice that now, every single carbon has three bonds. So they need one more. But the final one in each carbon's case is to a hydrogen atom, okay? And in skeletal structures, you do not show hydrogen atoms, which are bound to carbon atoms. So this is the full structure now of inositol. Okay, so it's this blue ring here. So I will denote it as this blue ring. So that blue ring in our cartoon structure represents inositol. Okay, so we've now got phosphatidyl, linked to inositol. Okay, so this molecule that we've got here is phosphatidyl inositol, or PI. But we want phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Okay, so the way we label the carbons up is we start up with this one here, and we call that 1, then 2, 3, 4. So we want a phosphate group off this fourth one, and we'll bind the phosphate group by a phosphoester link to the alcohol group off the fourth carbon, and we finally want another phosphate group off the fifth carbon down here. Okay, so that creates us phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, or PIP2. So, I hope what you can see is that it's just a phospholipid with a bigger head, with an extra um, bit here stuck on the side of it, a cytoplasmic 
bits stuck on the side of it. And it is this molecule that is a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer. So some of the phospholipids that you have aren't normal phospholipids. They are these phospholipids with this bigger head. Okay, um, It's this normal component of the phospholipid bilayer that our phospholipase C beta is going to act on. So the enzyme phospholipase C beta, uh, which remember is what the alpha Q uh, GTP complex is bound to and activated, is going to cut the bond between uh, this phosphate group here, and this turquoise was not a good colour to show this in, but it's going to cut there. It's going to cut the phosphoester link between the phosphate group here and the third alcohol group of glycerol. Now, what are the two molecules you're then going to generate? Well, one of the molecules you're going to generate is going to be just a glycerol molecule with two uh, long-chain carboxylic acids linked off it. Okay, so here are these two long-chain carboxylic acids, and here is our glycerol molecule in green. Okay, and that will remain stuck in the phospholipid by there, okay? Whereas this other component here, which is inositol with free phosphate groups attached to it. That won't remain in the phosphate, uh, sorry, it won't remain in the phospholipid bilayer. It was attached to the phospholipid bilayer by its attachment to the um, this molecule here, which I haven't actually given you the name of. I'll give you that now. Okay, so this molecule here, which is glycerol bound to two fatty acids, is known as a diacyl glyceride, or for short, DAG. Okay, and that name makes sense because glyceride implies glycerol. Okay, diacyl, well an acyl group is what's left over in a carboxylic acid group once you've taken the alcohol group off it. So let me just discuss this for a little bit. Okay, so if you've got a carboxylic acid group here, so it's got this carbon with the carbonyl group and the alcohol group here, and we'll just say this is some R group, okay, uh, then this is a carboxylic acid group. However, when you form an ester link to this and an alcohol group here, so let's say this is the alcohol group on our glycerol molecule, okay, let me move this more into the centre, then what happens is you remove this phos sorry, you remove this alcohol group off the carboxylic acid group, and you remove the hydrogen off the alcohol group, and those combine together to make water, and then the carbon here links to to the oxygen here, and therefore you've lost this alcohol group that was part of the carboxylic acid group, and all you've really added on to the um, glycerol molecule is this group here that I'm outlining in turquoise, and this turquoise group, tur sorry, this turquoise group is what's known as an acyl group, so it's slightly more general than a um, carboxylic acid group. A carboxylic acid group has something that's fixed onto it here, whereas an acyl group, it doesn't tell you what's fixed here. It could be anything, basically. Okay, so that's why this is called a diacyl glyceride, because you've effectively added two acyl groups onto the glyceride molecule, or the glycerol molecule. Okay, and this is often abbreviated to D-A-G for short. Okay, right, so... Now let's colour in the other molecules. So here's our inositol ring in blue here, this six-membered carbon ring. And here are our three phosphate groups off here. One, two, three. And I'll move this back over now. Okay. And this is now called inositol. Okay. Inositol. Well, that makes sense. And then we've got a phosphate group off the first carbon, phosphate group off the fourth carbon, and a phosphate group of the fifth carbon, so it's known as inositol 145 tris phosphate. Okay, now people don't often actually say inositol 145 tris phosphate. Instead, they often abbreviate this to I for inositol, P for phosphate, and they put three down there. So basically, PIP2 is split by phospholipase C beta into diacylglyceride, DAG, and IP3. Okay, now we're not actually interested for this pathway in the diacylglyceride. We're interested in the IP3 because the IP3 is going to cause the release of calcium from intracellular calcium stores. 
Okay, so in the endothelial cell, so let's have our picture of our endothelial cell here. So here is the endothelial cell. You have an intracellular organelle, okay? And this intracellular organelle is a big intracellular organelle, so we'll draw a nice big intracellular organelle. Okay, so this is the endoplasmic reticulum, a very famous intracellular organelle. Now, in the cytoplasm of the endothelial cell, the level of calcium is very low. Calcium level generally in the cytoplasm of a cell is around 100 nanomolar, okay? 100 nanomolar. And it's much higher in the endoplasmic reticulum. So you have this sequester, sorry, this sequestration of calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. So you have very high calcium within this intracellular organelle here, this endoplasmic reticulum, which I'm now highlighting in blue. Okay, and by the way, the endoplasmic reticulum is often abbreviated to the ER for short. Okay, now what IP3 is going to cause when you've actually produced it by uh, this G protein coupled reaction, okay, is it's going to bind to receptors on the surface of uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and it's going to lead to those receptors opening. Now, IP3 binding to the IP3 receptors does not actually cause the IP3 receptors to open in themselves, but it gets them ready to open. It leads to them opening, but not directly for an indirect mechanism. But we won't go through the details uh, in this video because we've got enough to discuss as it is without going through the details of the IP3 receptor. If you're interested, I've got an entire playlist on calcium signaling where we discuss this in incredible detail. Okay, but for our purposes, it's good enough to say IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor, which then opens and releases calcium into the cytoplasm. It's more complicated than that in reality, but uh, we'll simplify it down to that because that's the overall effect of it. It's, it that, is, that is effectively um, skipping a bunch of steps, but that is what happens when IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor. So... In the um, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum here, or the ER, you have a receptor for IP3. So here is this receptor for IP3. And this is known as the IP3 receptor. Okay, so this is the IP3 receptor. And as I say, IP3 does bind to the IP3 receptor. Specifically, four IP3 molecules bind to the IP3 receptor because it's actually a tetramer. Um, and this will trigger changes in the IP3 receptor. And then another molecule will come and bind to it. Calcium will come and bind to it. And that will then lead to the IP3 receptor opening. But overall, what's going to happen is that when IP3 binds, it is going to open the IP3 receptor. Okay, so now calcium can leave the uh, lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm. Okay, so here is the IP3 receptor in turquoise. Uh, sorry, not in turquoise, in vivid purple here. Okay, so IP3 causes the release of calcium from the intracellular stores, which means that calcium level in the cytoplasm of the cell is going to go up, okay? Now what does the what does this um, calcium going up in the cytoplasm actually lead to? Well, one of its targets, it's going to have a number of targets, but one of its targets is an enzyme known as cellular phospholipase A2. Okay, so where am I going to draw this? So I'm going to just complete the membrane of this intracellular organelle so that things look a little clearer. Okay, so it's, that it's obvious what this membrane actually is here. So here's the membrane of our endoplasmic reticulum. And now calcium has gone up in the cytoplasm of our cell, and we want to see what is that calcium going to activate but we'll continue this discussion where we'll see what it activates in the next video.